and okay, Jim, you're live. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. We'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, first will be the approval of minutes from our last meeting, um, our May, May 12th meeting. Um, I know Patriot sent those out, I think this morning, so I'm not sure if everyone's had a chance to look them over. But if so, does anybody have any, any comments or edits? No? All right. Well, let's get a Patrick, motion to did approve. Did you see my note? Uh, Jim, there's this typo. He found a typo. Sorry, I couldn't hear Scott. It's on page five, I believe. It's where I, I put banning instead of banding. Yep. And there, there, there's a few other minor things that I'll, I'll send to Patreon. So if, if you have anything, go ahead and go ahead and email them to, to Patreon or myself. Um, but with that, can we get a motion to approve them? So moved. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Very good. Um, we'll, we'll move to old business. Um, and I'm going to move Q, the green initiative um, up to the front because Dr. Parker's got a, a prior commitment. So I'm going to let Dr. Parker give you a quick update on that. Okay. We, this little ad hoc uh, working group uh, had its first organizational meeting uh, about three weeks ago in which we discussed the overall uh, big strategy uh, initiatives, what we were hoping to accomplish. Uh, I think it was very well received by the resort, uh, by the town. Uh, I subsequently uh, met with, and Kika was also there, and they, they were very much supportive of it, and subsequently have met with the club, and they are also uh, on board with the project. We are going to have our first uh, real working meeting uh, next Wednesday at 2 o'clock in town council chambers at which time the various entities will come back and we'll start to flesh out a kind of a, a charter, a timeline, and uh, general initiatives that each entity can do to help reduce our carbon footprint with the idea that this is a multi-year uh, sequenced uh, project uh, that will be something that is uh, doable uh, and isn't pie in the sky stuff. Uh, so I will have more to report at the next meeting. And uh, for those of you who missed uh, last meeting, I look forward to seeing you uh, next Wednesday and you know who you are. Uh, Petra, there's a conflict on the use of the town. So the third meeting that I moved to one o'clock, um, is that gonna be a problem? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Okay, I, we didn't hear you. You, got, you were very broken up. I just heard the one o'clock. Next. Wednesday, one o'clock, Petra, you said I could use it, the town council for a cert. Uh, if this, I'm not sure I'm going to be done by two o'clock. We can certainly meet in the, the smaller uh, chambers, uh, the little conference room behind there. We're, we're a small enough group that we can, we, we, we can find a spot and not interfere with the cert team. Okay. Yeah, no, sure. we'll, we'll get we'll get that figured out. Um, I'll send sounds, Mr. Nelson the email. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Well, we'll jump back to the uh, to the top of of old business. Um, kind of run through a number of these. I don't have an update on a lot of them, so um, no update on the QI landscape landscaping work group. Um, Next is Shorebird Stewardship. Aaron, I don't know if you have anything on that. I know that you know the program is active this year and we certainly have nesting birds. Um, so if you just wanna give a quick update on that. Sure, I can do that. Um, so nesting season's pretty much wrapped up out at the East End. Um, there's, there's, I don't think any active least turn nests anymore. Um, we had a pretty good season, lots of nests, lots of chicks. Um, we had several oyster catchers nest as well and, and a good number of Wilson's plovers. So I think overall it was a good season. Um, 
we'll uh, keep the signs up for another few weeks, just in case there's some chicks still hiding back in there. But uh, but other than that, that's that's pretty much pretty much done for this year. All right, very good. Um, next is flood mitigation and sea level rise. Lucas, uh, you got anything you wanna you wanna update us on? Um, I do have a presentation to the Kika board for the resilience plans, thresholds, and uh, initial recommendations for a monitoring program. So we will we'll be reviewing that on August. I believe it's the eighth. It's three weeks from from this week anyway. And after that, I'll be coming to the town. So that's my update on the resilience plan. Got it. All right, thank you. Um, next is uh, Grow Native Parkway Landscaping. Um, I don't have a whole lot on that. Obviously the project is completed and, and I'm sure those of you who, probably most of you drive the parkway every once in a while, um, all of our perennials are really starting to look really good, I think. Um, a lot of flowers popping now. Um, and so overall, you know, really pleased with the project and how it went. Um, I don't know if you noticed our guardrail was being repainted again. Um, so we, we painted it before the tournament and uh, it was not the right color. So now it's being repainted to a, to a different Kiowa brown color. Um, apparently, just, just for the record, if you go to Sherwin-Williams and ask for Kiowa brown, there are about 12 different versions of Kiowa Brown on file at Sherwin Williams. So ultimately we found the right Kiowa Brown. And so um, that should be, should be wrapped up now, I think. Uh, next is rodenticides and wildlife. Um, just a couple of updates on that. So since our last meeting, uh, we've tested five additional animals um, that included three raccoons and two alligators. Um, this is the first time we've tested, tested alligators. Um, so of the three raccoons, one of them showed exposure to a, to a second generation anticoagulant. So that's 33%, substantially lower than what we had been seeing. So it's a small sample size, but that is, that is a, you know, another good sign. Um, both of the alligators we tested showed exposure to SGAs. Um, both of them had been exposed to, as, had been exposed to brotofacum. Um, and j just that one alone. So, you know, no surprise that, that it would show up in alligators, um, but just another, you know, indicator of how pervasive these things are um, in the environment and how, how easily, easily they move up the food chain. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to test nuisance alligators as we, as we remove them um, and see what, see what that shows us. Anybody have any questions on that? Jim, I have, uh, this is Jim Sullivan. I have one comment. I, I had a friend and neighbor who approached a pest control company about what they thought were either mice or rats. And the comment they got from the pest control co company is that the island is being overrun by rodents because we can't use second generation Pest control agents, the older agents don't work. Have there been many reports of that? And it's a relatively, it was actually Williams, which I think is one of the bigger companies that does that kind of work. But I was surprised to hear that. Is, is there any truth in that? Um, so the short answer is no. Um, but I have received a number of a number of calls, kind of kind of similar to that. That you know there are more rats than usual, or you know rat problems are higher this year than they have been in the past. Um, but it's honestly only been a handful, you know, six or six or eight calls, or you know, throughout the course of the year, um, which is not that's not uncommon. Um, there there are years that I probably get ten or fifteen calls about it. Um, so there does seem, you know, there does seem to be that perception out there. Um, and I've heard it from some pest control companies as well. Um, but you know, whether it's true or not, you know, we don't have any numbers or statistics on, 
you know, rodent abundance or, you know, no, number of rodent complaints or anything like that. But, you know, I think that, you know, the kind of the larger question that you pose, which is, you know, if, if there are a lot of, you know, if there, if there is a rodent issue, um, a lot of companies as well as individuals immediately like to place blame onto the town for that. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is that, you know, just because you're not using an SGA doesn't mean that you don't have a rodenticide that is just as effective at your disposal if you get to that process and integrated pest management. So, you know, I've talked to a couple of big companies that have made the switch from, from a, a soft bait SGA to a, to a soft bait containing colocalciferol. Um, and they have not noticed any difference in effectiveness in control. So, you know, you know, and that, and that's a, you know, that the one company that I spoke to recently, I mean, they service probably a thousand accounts. So, you know, I've heard, I have heard from some companies that have had issues um, with, with bait effectiveness or, or bait palatability issues. And a lot of times what, what seems to have happened is that they switch from a soft bait containing an SGA to a hard bait containing either colocalciferol or bromethylene. Um, and they were not getting the control that, that, that they had in the past. And so, you know, at least one of those companies has now switched to a soft bait, which should solve the problem. But, but at the end of the day, an SGA kills a rat or a mouse just as well, or, or colocalciferol or bromethylene kills a rat or a mouse just as well, just as effectively as an SGA, you know, it, as long as the, the, the bait formulation is comparable. So, yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, kind of back to the whole, you know, is there a rodent issue on Kiowa now? I mean, sure, we have rodents out here, but, you know, it's, it's also an issue that, you know, the, the count, county and statewide, you know, there was a Post and Courier article this spring about how pervasive rodents were this, you know, this year. And so, um, I don't think it's anything unique to Kiowa, even if there is, you know, a slight uptick in numbers. Yeah. So we're not having any of the major companies working against what we're trying to accomplish. Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, good. Jim, I'd also comment, I'd be very surprised to hear that about Williams, because I don't know that Leanne Williams has ever used poisons in their, their wildlife removal work. Uh, if anything, they use stem traps. Yeah. So I don't, I'm no. not sure that's Williams, or if it is, it might be one of her employees, but that is certainly not their policy. Good. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, I, don't, I, I know that Leanne, you know, does not use any rodenticides, or at least that's what she's told me. Um, she has been playing around and uh, using this, it's called Contrapest. It's a, it's a birth control um, agent that's delivered in a liquid form. I know she's been trying that on some of her accounts. I don't know how successful it's been. Um, but yeah, she certainly it, you know, is not supposed to be using rodenticides and says that she does not. So. Good. We're, we're using that Contrapest with her. But oh, yeah. Of course, it's going to take six months for that to show right. an effect. Right. It's well, It'll be interesting to see what you what you see. By the way, John, there's a very large rodent behind you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. She's she followed me home one day. <laughs> nice. <laughs> she looks uh, expensive to keep up. <laughs> uh, but she, she had... eats most anything she wants to. <laughs> Jim, I had one other wildlife issue. Uh, I live in the preserve and we're starting to see pretty frequently armadillo. Uh, is there some, something we should be doing or not doing uh, because we're seeing them at some frequency and in multiple numbers? Right. Yeah. So I've, I've gotten a number of emails on, on armadillos um, here in the last couple of months. Um, you know, they, they showed up on the Island probably three or four years ago. Um, but certainly, as you indicate, you know, they're, they're doing well here and we have a lot more now than we did three or four years ago. So it's, it's fairly common to see one on the island. Um, 
you know, I think I, I do hear from from owners that there's a concern about about armadillos, and you know, my my response is is typically the same, you know, which is, you know, they're they, they've naturally moved here. Um, they, they are now part of the Kiowa ecosystem. Um, they can cause minor issues. Um, you know, they, they certainly, you know, so they're insectivores, so they're eating grubs and other things, you know, that are in the soil. They're very good diggers. And so, you know, you might see, you know, some small foraging holes in, in areas of sod or that sort of thing, um, but nothing that's going to cause significant damage. Um, they, they can dig fairly extensive burrows. Um, and about the only time that really becomes an issue is if it's, you know, a significant burrow that's underneath the foundation of the home. Um, but, but if those cases arise, they're pretty easily dealt with on a case by case basis. Um, you either trap the animal and fill the hole or simply fill the hole. Um, you know, I, I had the issue, you know, I had that exact issue at my house in West Ashley. I've had armadillos in my backyard for 10 years now. Um, but I did have a hole under my concrete foundation where they were burrowing in. And it's a simple matter to, to fill it up with concrete and close it off. And, you know, I haven't had any, any other issues. So um, I think the concern is, is, is a little bit overblown um, and that armadillos are not going to be, going to be even a significant, you know, even a minor problem for the Island, but there will be some, some, you know, an individual case by case basis, there'll be times that armadillos need to be managed or trapped or or damage mitigated. But. Yeah. That's very helpful, Jim. Uh, has there been any thought about putting that in writing and including it somewhere so that? Because yep. I've had several people mention it to me, and candidly, I didn't know what to say because I've heard all of the antidotes, <laughs> right, about damage they can cause, but. And that you can get leprosy from them too. I hear that one. <laughs> Is that well. right? Oh, which which you can. I mean, they 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 can transmit leprosy, but but you've got to be, let's say, yeah, you've got to be very close in proximity to them, and probably preparing them to be on your dinner table um, for you to have any possible chance of, okay. of getting leprosy from an armadillo. Yeah. So, um, but yes, we we do have an article planned. Um, Stephanie Braswell and I are working on that now, so we Wonderful. will put something out about armadillos here in the here in the near future. Wonderful, thank you, Jim. Both Jims, uh, thanks for that because that was on my list to be asking too because I've been getting uh, feedback from people. So I think an article is a very good idea. Okay, sounds good. Um, Jim, yeah. Jim let, let me ask you about the alligators. How how do you think they're getting the SGAs? I mean, they'll eat anything that's around, but probably raccoons and possums would that, be my guess. That is really or down to drink the water and they grab a few. Yeah, I would think so. Um, that's my guess, at least. I mean, prob probably raccoons more than possums. Uh, is it pretty low concentration in the alligators? Yeah, because I wouldn't think low. that would necessarily be a major food source for them. Yeah, it was. It was pretty low. Um, you know, certainly I could pull up the numbers, but it was lower than most of the raccoons. Um, so, so not nothing too significant, but, but certainly present. Um, let's see, also on the rodenticide topic, um, not a whole lot on this, you know, this proposed Clemson research project, um, you know, still, still working towards a, a more detailed proposal. Um, the graduate student Megan Keating has been has been selected. She arrived at Clemson this past weekend, um, so she'll make her first visit to the island in August, early August. Um, and at that point, you know, we'll have some additional conversations with her about, you know, more specific details of the research project and 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 those sorts of things. And and she'll just start to to get familiar with the island. And and meet the you know pertinent pertinent groups and individuals out here. So um, yeah, that project will be will be a work in progress, or the proposal will be a work in progress. Um, you know until until later in the fall, um, and then you know the first real field work for that study will be in January and February of 2022. 
So that's kind of where we stand right now. You know, with that work, we don't really need just a general study of the, the food web uh, of, of how the adenocides move on through and all through the island, we, which might be necessary to do this, but what we want is a bobcat recovery plan. I mean, what do we need to know to help the bobcat populations recover? And what pieces of information don't we have that would enable us to develop such a plan? So I think the work that she does needs to be focused uh, on that sort of application. Um, and that will include uh, understanding human interactions and, and, and how you manage people along with that. And that, that may take research for that too, uh, for this particular situation. But we, I, I really would hope that that study becomes focused into helping us solve the problem as opposed to just a, a generalized let's study the ecology of, of rodents on the island sort of study. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree 100%. Um, and that's certainly, you know, our, our, our goal and our hope in all of this is that everything that we learn will, will be beneficial at, you know, bringing our bobcats back and reducing the impacts, you know, across, across the food web. Um, so like I said, you know, we've still got several months of conversations before, you know, we kind of dial in the specific details. And so, you know, hopefully, hopefully, John, when Megan's here, I know the Conservancy folks wanted to meet, meet with Megan and, and we may have one, one or two of the professors here as well. So um, I know they plan to invite you, but certainly we'll make sure that, that you're part of at least one of those meetings when they're here just to kind of let them know your thoughts and kind of work through some of this. It involves asking the right questions in order to organize the research. Um, and so, yeah, we should have some discussions about what are those kinds of questions and what do we need to know to answer those kinds of questions. Sure. Yep, I agree. Um, anything else on any of that? All right, we'll go to deer management, no update. Uh, conservancy projects. Lee, you got anything on your current projects? Yeah, just a quick few updates. Uh, following the PGA, we went out and we collected all of the, the uh, data loggers for the groundwater wells. Uh, so we have data going up to June. Um, so we'll be using that information to come up with seasonal water tables since our last um, or previous uh, data pool back in February. Um, so we've been working with the College of Charleston to make sure all that's coming in smoothly, uh, working with DJ, who's our graduate assistant on the project, uh, to make sure that goes in smoothly. Um, and everything's going smoothly with the uh, Marsh Vulnerability Project. Uh, we're going to be continuing working on that, creating maps. Uh, we're going to be working with uh, Norm Levine for the remainder of that project. So uh, but that's all I have for, for now. All right. Any questions for Lee? All right, well, we will move on to new business. The, the only item of new business we have, um, you know, so, so as, 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 all you, as all of y'all know, you know, we've had discussions at several meetings um, about potential conservancy projects for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, the town has $50,000 in the line item um, for that purpose. And so I think at our last meeting, we looked at four or five different projects and kind of whittled them down to two that we thought were good um, or, or had, had potential. And since, since that meeting, um, we've had some additional conversations. And, and so what, what Petra sent out yesterday, um, you know, basically removes one of the projects we discussed last time, which was the ground-based LIDAR. Um, and adds a little bit to, to what we're now calling an integrated watershed study. Um, so, so Lee, you know, Lee, I guess I'll let you take it or answer any questions, but, you know, so, so the purpose of today's meeting is to discuss that proposal, um, you know, obviously provide comment and feedback to Lee 
and then hopefully, assuming the committee is in favor, we will then make a, a formal recommendation to town council um, to, to approve funding for this project. Um, it'll still have to go to town council in August um, for their approval, but we need a recommendation from this committee first. Um, and that's pretty much where we're at. So Lee, I don't know if you want to kind of just hit, hit the high points and then take questions, that might be the easiest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, going back to what we've been looking at on Keel Island for the past three or so years, you know, we focused a lot on the ponds and all the upland areas. And um, I think for, for me, I think I've seen also a lot of people here focused on how are we affecting the estuarine environment, how are we affecting the marshes? And that's sort of the culmination of these projects is trying to figure out how water on the island as well as within the estuarine system is affecting each other um, and how the marsh is affected by water in general. Um, so, you know, based on some of the discussions in here, trying to figure out, you know, how much water is going in and out, as well as what is the quality of that water. Um, and just trying to begin to have monitoring equipment to begin studying this. Uh, also studying inputs uh, to, of water onto the island is uh, some of the things that um, we're focused on. Um, so within this study, we're looking at um, splitting the island up into different sections based on watersheds. Uh, they're going to be based on what uh, Lucas worked on for his thesis for Keogh Island and used, uh, used for looking at uh, watershed drainage on the island. Um, we're going to split it up into sections and study those to create these water budgets. Um, and we're going to take these, this information from water budgets, we're going to use the tidal, uh, tidal um, gauge information, and we're also going to use weather station information. Uh, and with this, we're going to establish several different um, weather stations on the island to make sure we get a full comprehensive look at Kewa Island in the different regions. Uh, currently, we have two weather stations that we know that we can get data from, which is uh, one at uh, along Beachwalker Drive on the Timbers, uh, there's also one at the Kika office, uh, both using the same instrumentation. It's the, the Davis um, uh, Pro Vantage 2. Uh, so we're looking to procure those two, two additional weather stations that could put them on the, uh, the eastern side of the island. Um, and then we're going to start looking into studying water quality uh, in the marshes. Uh, so we know Kika, they, uh, they consistently measure the water quality within the ponds using uh, you know, different types of measuring equipment. Uh, one of them is a, uh, an exo probe, um, which is a, uh, a basically this just giant uh, thing with different sons on it and gives them all this information. So they do spot checks with that. Um, so we're looking at getting similar equipment uh, in order to start uh, doing the same measurements uh, within the estuarine environment in the marsh um, and focusing on specifically areas near the the major marsh outflows. Um, so looking at uh, two specific places, uh, one at uh, the Inlet Cove uh, outfall, as well as the one at Canvas Back, um, is because that's where the majority of the water flows off of the island. So getting uh, monitoring equipment to look at those two areas is what we're looking at. So, you know, with the bulk of the, the funds that we'd be using are to get uh, equipment to begin monitoring uh, for additional uh, things such as, you know, more climate studies as well as uh, more water quality um, studies within the marsh specifically. And then being able to create um, some site specific water budgets based on these two watersheds where these outflows are. Um, and we saw, we've also reserved about $14,000, um, which is left over from after procuring that equipment. And um, you know, there's potential for us to, um, to have a graduate assistant work at the Kiowa Conservancy to, to help us not only capture this data, but also analyze it. Uh, and there's also the ability potentially to use those funds to work with uh, the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources through an on, already ongoing contract with Kika to potentially uh, add in additional analyses that we can use. Um, so that's currently what's in the proposal, just the, the major highlights of it. Um, but, you know, one of the things we want to do is continue to look into water resources on the island uh, because it is sort of one of the, the major impending things kind of right at our front, uh, uh, front doorstep. So um, this uh, study will help us learn more about the, the hydrological cycle on the island and uh, learn how to protect our marshes better. Thank you, Lee. Um...
Anybody have questions, comments? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Lee, uh, it all looks uh, quite interesting to me and good. I do have one question about controls. And I think one of our interests at the end of the day is how to keep the marshes healthy. And uh, so it seems to me it would be very useful if you had a couple of controls that were not where the pond outfalls occur so that we know what the nat what the ignoring our pond outfalls, what's happening to the health of our marshes. So, you know, some of these measures at places like uh, Cinder Creek or maybe the, the uh, creek basin, what, I can't remember the name of it, it leads up to the Van Dross plantation from the marsh. Some control areas which says, okay, you're not getting pond outfalls, but it would be very interesting to know if the water quality is a lot better, a lot worse than it is with our outfalls and kind of give us a, a baseline of uh, what's happening that's kind of beyond our control, if you will, mm -hmm. to our marshes. Yeah, I mean, certainly that, that's definitely a good idea. And, and the, the equipment we have, you know, potentially going to get can potentially be moved to those tidal creeks that are further away and not influenced by pond outfalls. Um, and I guess the intent of this first set of studies is to look at how the water quality from the ponds uh, is compared to the water quality in the marsh and seeing how that differs. Uh, based on tidal cycles, that sort of thing. But I think, you know, definitely some additional studies looking into these areas that are not influenced by these, these uh, pond discharges would be interesting. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, uh, you know, John, you may have more information about this than I do, but, you know, the, the, uh, the exosons are used pretty frequently by NOAA and other state and uh, federal agencies. Um, so, you know, you can, we can potentially get similar data that could be from areas where there's little to no impervious surfaces versus a lot. And we could potentially compare ourselves to other communities if we can get a hold of that data. Um, and I think that might be a benefit of working with uh, DNR through an extended contract. Um, so we can begin looking at similar data in other regions where we do not have that influence of ponds or, or um, surface flow from uh, upland areas. So, certainly the Ace Basin has all the swamp data that they've collected now for 30 years or more. Um, huge data set and it's all available online uh, that you can download and look at immediately. Should give you some kind of a sense of the variability that you would see over time, uh, seasonally and, and year to year variability. Um, those sites all those sites in the Ace Basin are pretty pristine sites. There is some variability, Big Bay um, is a little bit less so, but you know, you, you've got a variety there and you can certainly sort that out. Uh, I, I agree with Jim though, that uh, a side-by-side -side control would be useful. Um, in, in the proposal, which I, I compliment you on I think is an excellent proposal and coming to the town like this probably the best proposal ever presented here to this committee um, you explain I think pretty well how you would do the water budget and, and some of the benefits of a water budget uh, following up on Jim yeah we want to look at, at you know what to look for in the outfalls coming off the island but maybe a little bit more description of what it is you would look for there. I think probably what you're looking for and you alluded to briefly in there is the amount of change, the magnitude of the change and the rapidity of the change in the water quality and the impacts that that could have. Um, but to really understand the impact of, of magnitude and rapidity of change, a control site. Uh, would be worthwhile too, because as tide changes normally, what do you see? So you got those two sources of the swamp data and and also a, your own control since you've got two XOs. Um, if, if I may, a um, couple of other comments. Um, with the XOs that you get, as we've talked about, they're really cool, but they're not as simple as 
at least have them. And the neat thing is, uh, invited you to come over to her lab to spend a day or two with her technicians uh, working on the XOs coming out of the Ace Basin. So you can really get a hands-on uh, very quick. You learn how to use them in a day or two and, and not, you know, have to try to teach yourself all the ins and outs of them. Um, so that is a benefit in your relationship with her as is very positive in that regard. Um, uh, two other comments. One is that um, some of this work that you're proposing is, is supported by your NIFWIF grant. And I think it'd be important to point out to town council that you are using that to leverage the benefit you'll be getting from the town funds. The town is really getting more than their money's worth because you know, it's, uh, you already have the federal grant money to support you with some of the day-to-day uh, -day logistics that would be involved. So by combining those grants, you get more, each of them get more for the more bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. And the, the last comment is I, I'm, I'm all in favor of moving ahead with this type of work. I think this is great. Um, I, I, I don't want you to feel that every year going to town council, you would have to have a brand new project in order to justify the funding because some of these like a groundwater monitoring needs to be a long-term commitment. I mean, really it's going to probably take 10 years before you really have a good understanding of what those uh, groundwater dynamics are. And I think it's quite legitimate for the town to fund some of that ongoing work. Um, the personnel to, to maintain that and interpret it. Um, over time, you may have to replace some of your loggers, things like that. Um, and we don't have enough of that sort of long-term research commitments anywhere because everything is on a two or three year cycle. And, and we, that's that long-term data that will really tell us things. So uh, I, I would hope this committee would understand that if in future years you come back and just ask for some more money to continue doing what you are doing as well as anything new that you want to do. Uh, that said, I, I like what you're proposing. And uh, I, I think you've, with the XOs, I think you've cut that down, focused it so that it's doable and you can get some good data this in the next couple of years, what you have. Um, I might take out the optional things altogether because that could be confusing to council now. You know, what do you mean by DOM and what do you mean by algal monitors and stuff like that? And I, I think, you know, we need to think a lot more about what that type of stuff would tell us. Anyways, uh, you with what you are asking for, you can get a lot of good data that, and you can put those at a lot of different places to get good data. So you got a lot going there. Great. Lee, I had uh, maybe as a follow up to what John just said, I, I wondered what is the going to be the continuing status of the two current projects? So yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the Marshall Vulnerability Project, I'm potentially seeing us use this in subsequent years. There's already tool sets and everything built in uh, to RJS. We can run this when we get additional DNR data, additional NAEP imagery, that sort of thing. So it can be ongoing and we can just keep this as a catalog. Um, and we can use the information that the college gave us to kind of inform us on how to go forward with, uh, you know, you know, reoccur, you know, I guess updating this information every five or 10 years or so, whenever that, that's kind of like the time period we've, we've seen that people recommend uh, updating at least the land change information. Uh, with the groundwater, um, you know, I think continuing to study that is going to be very important because understanding those changes in the groundwater actually allows us to come up with more updated uh, water budgets. Um, and that also, you know, you know, it, you know, frequently changes and varies between season and um, the climate data that we get, like how much rainfall do we have, how hot it is, what is the solar radiation, that sort of thing. 
Um, so getting understanding that groundwater, there's differences across the island allows us to look at, you know, site specific information. So I'm, I'm thinking these, they're, they're both important to study and continuing to monitor over time. Um, it may be that maybe over time we, we don't use as many groundwater wells. Maybe we, we, you know, scale it back to 15, but currently the spread across the island gives us a very good glimpse about the changes in groundwater and uh, even at, at small site specific changes. Um, but I think continuing the information actually allows us to understand our environment over time. And I think after about 10, 15 years, we'll have a good grip on uh, exactly what these fluctuations look like and what variations really mean. Do you have funding arranged to support that? Uh, not currently, but I think John uh, made a, a really good point is to, you know, maybe in subsequent years after this, uh, maybe focus a little bit on uh, asking the town or maybe even looking at conservancy funds specifically for maintaining and maybe updating some of these, uh, these wells and the equipment within the wells. Um, because I think after five or 10 years, we're going to start to see some, some, some maintenance being needed. Yeah, well, I in support of what John said, if it, if it isn't maintained at a high level every year, the effort on it, it'll eventually just fade away and you probably won't get the benefit that we hope to get. So I, I would encourage you to, whether it's from the Conservancy or wherever, to be sure you have funding to, to maintain the good work that's been started. Absolutely. Benefit so far is just setting it up. Um, and that, you know, the initial investment, but the real benefit will come over time, of being able to monitor over time. And a, a good thing is, is, you know, I think uh, Solent, if you need to have your equipment, you know, repaired or anything, you can send it to them. They'll repair it, get everything set up for you and send it back. So I think that's, that's a good benefit of working with just one organization and one type of day logger is they can repair it all in house and they can send it back. Um, so that's definitely something to consider probably in the next four years. And following up on top of Jim's there, uh, it, it's good and ambitious to take on new projects and expand because it's needed, but make sure that you don't uh, overstretch yourself, that you would suffer, that some of the other ongoing projects could suffer because you're trying to start up too many new things. I don't think that's the case right now, but it, it could lead to that if there's a demand to have always more and more new projects down the road. Make sure you support what you have. One question that, that Jim's comment uh, raised in my head about the imagery. Um, mm -hmm. This year and, and in the future, are, are you doing multispectral analysis in order to map vegetation and also to analyze the chlorophyll concentrations? Uh, no, we're not currently, but that has been in discussion. Um, and I think trying to, to build up capacity to do that sort of thing would be very, um, uh, very needed because um, we can study pretty much all the habitats on the island using that sort of, uh, you know, analysis using GIS. Um, so that's, that's definitely on the table of things I'm, I'm looking into to running on, on for Kiowa. Chlorophyll analysis can give you yeah. a relative measure of health of the plants of the marsh. Um, I mean, certainly it's widely used in agriculture now to look at the health of a crop based on the chlorophyll concentrations that are being seen in certain types of crops. So I think it's something that, you know, you want to explore with Norm um, as we go forward. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess that can all be done with marsh health what you're, you're focusing on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard we can use NAPE imagery for that. And Norm at the college has showed us how he can, you know, change the, 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 the bands to look at specific chlorophyll content within marshes and in ponds and such. So I think uh, we I'll probably have a discussion with him sometime in the next few weeks about that and how we might be able to do that in-house in with some, some of the new upcoming NAPE imagery. Good. You've got so much invested these first two years in that that you, you certainly want to keep carrying it forward. Absolutely. I had uh, just one uh, comment or 
question. Uh, I know of a couple of people that have fairly advanced weather stations sort of at their, their homes that they send their data up into through the, the internet. I don't know if you've given any thought to trying to figure out how you can augment your weather data by tapping into some of those people. Yes, um, Lucas and Jim might know more about this, but usually the, the, there's these weather systems through Davis. You, they get sent, all of their data gets sent into WeatherLink and you can actually mm -hmm. uh, push all of it online and you can take that data and analyze it. And I believe there's one place sort of out on Governor's Drive, right before you get to the preserve, there is one weather station that's um, owned by a, a private citizen on Kiowa. Um, but I'm not, in, and I'm not entirely sure how to get that information, but potentially it could, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's certainly, there, there's at least one private Davis weather station on the island. There may be more than one. <clears throat> now, um, the tricky part is getting historical data. Um, you know, you can, you, you can get data from the weather station but without the permission of the owner, you can't go as far back looking at historical data or, or pulling data out and, you know, into a spreadsheet or something like that. So, um, you know, I think the potential is there to get, you know, data from additional sources. Um, but, you know, also, right, we're trying to standardize the, the way that weather data is collected using the same brand systems, the same, same sensors so that, yeah, there's not potentially some some error, or some issue, right. um, you know, and also we don't know how these other stations are being maintained, right? Is the is their engage clogged up and no one's cleaning it out? Um, you know, so that, so the hope would be, you know, that at the end of this we would have four well placed, almost identical weather stations covering most of the island. Um, right. It would be under our, you know, under our collective control, if you will. Yeah, I think I know the person who has the one that's there close to Governor's Drive. Um, um, I could uh, sort of find out what he's got and pass it on to Lee. Because yeah, I'm yeah, sure he'd, he loves sharing his data. So uh, yeah, I don't think there any problem. During the, the last storm, I looked at several on the island. There's, there's eight on Kiowa that I saw. Oh. Um, and they're spread out pretty well. Um, so... I know Ocean Course has one. Um, I saw the one near Governor's. There's one on Surf Song. There's one at Cougar. Um, and then there's a couple at the Eastern end, almost around Timbers. So that's looking at both the WeatherLink website and Weather Underground. But like Jim said, you, you can't really get any historical data unless it's on Weather Underground. We're still leaving it. Yeah, and I think maybe that's part of the due diligence before we, you know, establish all of them is making sure that we reach out to all of them, learn more about those stations maybe, and then um, seeing where the, the right spots to put it in. And I think, you know, we, we've been, in previous discussions, we, we have talked about putting some of them on the east of the island um, and in the center, sort of where we, you know, since all of the ones that the town and Kika have are sort of on the western part of the island, um, trying to see if we can, um, you know, more or less have an understanding where the best place uh, these uh, subsequent ones is probably something I'm going to look into before we uh, establish the stations. So, um, good points. Um, All right. Any more discussion on that? Uh, Lee, in, in the proposal, you talked about uh, being able to compare the water quality data from all the ponds and the years of collection of that data that, that's been going on. Uh, Matt, is there, there won't be any problem in sharing that data, will there, with the Conservancy and everybody else? No. Am I, all you, all you historical data on the ponds? No, there, there shouldn't be an issue in sharing that data. Um, it's, it's, again, it's the same basic data um, that Lee is looking to get temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, um, that sort of a thing. So that's, that's not going to be an issue. Um, and it's, you know, I guess it's, uh, it, it's needed for, for the, for the whole project in general to, to work. You, you can't make a comparison if there's no data to compare it to. Right. So 
uh, we would gladly share that. Um, and I guess to answer your question, and also just for comments um, on the proposal as a whole, um, I think y your idea of using controls, both you know local here on the island, um, and then also more pristine environments like down in the A space, and I think that's a great idea. Um, it it you know it just acts as part of the scientific method. When you have a good control, it really helps you. Um, get the most out of the data that you're collecting. Um, and then, you know, I, I guess at the proposal as a whole, the, if, if you read it and, and it is lengthy, but I think it, it's fairly well put together, but I would like to bring to light that there is some misleading information um, in the proposal kind of assumptions that, and, and maybe it's just the way that I read it because uh, it does hit close to home for me, but assumptions that the, you know, the pond water that's being discharged is unhealthy or bad or toxic or detrimental to wildlife and fish. And I think that's a dangerous assumption to make. Um, and it certainly reads that way to me. Um, and, you know, there, there's some verbiage not to, to pick it apart, but, you know, that there's uh, a a lot of fish kills or frequent fish kills. And, and, and we really don't have that. Um, very few um, per year, you're talking about, you know, less than five. That's not very many when you talk about a, a group of 123 ponds. Um, and then also, I think it discussed, you know, toxic algal blooms, harmful algal blooms being discharged. And that's, that's not happening. Part of part of what is looked at by DNR in their algal uh, ecology lab is algal abundance um, in species, and are they uh, capable of producing toxins? Are they at an abundance that they could do that um, and, and be toxic? And we we keep an eye on that. And I just wanted to make sure that anyone who would read this proposal would not be misled into thinking that that the water we're discharging is bad because quite frankly, I don't think that it is bad. Um, you know, is there a perceived problem in our marsh? I'm not positive that there is. Um, you know, that's not to say it's not important to look at how our discharge water is affecting our marsh or at least the quality of that water. I think that's, that's very important, but I do think it reads a little bit misleading that we have a perceived problem when I'm not sure that we do. And one of the, I guess, reasons I kind of bring this up is there's something on Ikea that came up about the reason that we were seeing some raccoons that were, uh, you know, seemed to be going through a, a bout of, of distemper or something. Maybe Jim would comment on that, what exactly it is, but somebody commented that, uh, you know, it was due to domoic acid um, from a harmful algal bloom in our pond system, which is absurdly incorrect. And, and I, it's just dangerous to put that kind of stuff out there. Not that we're putting this out on a public platform like Ikea, but it's, it is, uh, I guess it's concerning to me because when that information gets out there, um, it's kind of looked back at, on me as the manager of our ponds. Um, so just kind of wanted to comment on that, that it does read slightly misleading to me and it could just be the way that I read it and everyone else thinks it sounds great. Um, yeah. Yeah. And to follow up with that, Matt, you know, I, I don't think our intentions were to, were to, you know, put any slight on the ponds or the drainage. I think, you know, we, we've had discussions before and I think that, certainly. you know, what, you know, we, we don't know what it's like. And I think that's what I was trying to get at with there. And I may have pushed it into a direction maybe that may have been misleading a little bit. But, you know, if there's any specific sections you think that, you know, may need a little bit more wording to clear it up, feel free to send it to me. I'm glad to change it before it goes uh, to, uh, to council. Because um, the last thing I want to do is, um, you know, put out something that may be alarming or misleading or anything. So, um I'm more than happy to work with you on that. So, one of the reasons for having a control, I mean, you may find that uh, the areas without falls are actually more healthy than in the control areas. 
I mean, I don't know. And if there is a problem, we have the opportunity to do some kind of treatment of our outfalls if it's really bad, if, if we know there's a problem. I think Matt has a very good point that you know, one could read it like that. Uh, I, I know what he's talking about. My interpretation was we're going to find out and probably rule out that there really is not a problem. Uh, with the outfall. And it, and I, I don't think it's going to be quality of the water. If anything, it's going to be the rapidity of change. And, you know, not much you're going to do about that. But um, good, I think that's good discussion there. Lots Last. of things to learn. The, the, there are some interesting toxic algae in, in some of the ponds over time. But like you say, the, they don't last and the concentrations aren't that high. Um, and you know, Kiowan should be commended for the fact that they've had DNR, uh, DNR monitor the toxic algae in the ponds for years now, uh, 20 years probably, uh, because there are other island communities that absolutely would not let them look at it because uh, they're afraid that they might find something. We can find everything here in Kiowa at one time or another though, but it's not probably not a problem. And Matt, you, you associate most fish kills, don't you, with high temperature and, and low oxygen kills? That tends to be the case. I mean, we're, we see most of them, um, you know, into July, August, September, um, but really the, the hottest, you know, in Jul July and August, and it, it can be after you get a, huge you know thunder shower that dumps an inch or two of rain on the island pretty quickly and, and you end up with a, a rapid mixing event which ultimately robs the water column of oxygen um very very few fish kills uh since i've been here could be attributed to something other than uh just dissolved oxygen being too low to support life and your regular weekly measurements probably correlate with that. Correct. All right. Well, that was that was good discussion. Um, are we prepared to uh, to make a motion to make a recommendation on this? I move we to recommend the pro project. All right. A second. All right, John. Gotcha. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so we are recommending the town council approve the funding of this project not to exceed $50,000. Sounds good. Thank y'all. Thanks, everyone. All right, we'll move to, uh, to reports. Uh, town is first. I don't have a whole lot. Um, Nothing really new with Bobcat GPS. Um, you know, he lost the one the one Bobcat back in April, got hit by a car. The other five are doing fine. Um, uh, we found the two two dens from our, our three living females. Um, you know, our, our fourth female was the one that got hit by a car in April. Um, and then the, the one female that didn't den, um, she's the one that we caught last fall and she's almost 14 years old. So um a, a very 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 old bobcat so it, it may be that she's no longer having kittens um so so that's that, that's all lo looking a lot better than it has the last few years so that's that's good um quick update on alligators um, and matt i don't know if you're going to touch on this but i have it here um we've received 15 nuisance alligator calls so far this year and removed two Two nuisance alligators to date, um, which is lower than most years, probably. Um, certainly the last couple of years. So that's good as well. Um, the only other thing I have um, is some of the work that Aaron's doing. Um, so he's, you know, as you all know, for a number of years, he's been banding painted bunnings, um, primarily in, in residential backyards at bird feeders um, this time of year. And so he's doing that again this year and has been to six or eight, 
six or eight locations so far. He's got eight or ten homes left to sample, and he should be done with that by August 1st. Uh, and then other than that, I know he's gearing up for fall migration banding, which starts August 15th, and hiring all of his technicians and getting ready for a, for a busy fall of bird banding. So that's, that's all I have. Um, so we'll move on to Kika. Matt, you got anything else? Um, not really. I mean, you touched on the alligators um, and, you know, we're, we're just kind of as far as pond management goes in a, kind of our monitoring holding pattern for the summer. Like I was talking with John about, um, it's the time of year when our water is getting really hot and we're just trying to keep tabs on everything on a daily basis to hopefully prevent any, uh, you know, negative outcomes, I guess, and also monitoring algal growth and just aquatic growth. Um, I guess the storm update, I, I don't know. I mean, we think the, the pond system handled it well. We had almost, depends on what weather station you looked at, but mine here at the maintenance office recorded three 0.77 inches of rain um, and did not have any major fish kills as a result, which is pretty good. And I think for the land management side of things, just some really minor debris pickup, maybe one or two trees down, but ultimately the island fared pretty well on that. Um, that's pretty much all I've got on, on that for updates. All right, thanks Matt. Lucas, you got anything else? Uh, not much. I, I did uh, take a couple looks at some of the data that we collected at the weather stations and at the uh, um, the tide gauge at the Kiowa River Bridge and, and the one in Ocean Park. And it was pretty interesting. It seems like we got about a foot and a half of storm surge um, right as that tornado had, tornado warning was issued. So it's almost like we got one minor surge and then, or one surge and then almost a minor one about 30 minutes later as another band came through. So just some exciting stuff coming from the monitoring that's in place, I think. Yeah, oh, I agree. I, I did look at, at the Timbers weather station. Um, our highest wind gust was 60 miles an hour and that was in the, the, the five o'clock time frame, 5 a.m. Um, but we, we had gust above, above 40 from about 1 a.m. to, to 6 a.m. Um, I think our highest sustained was 37. Um, and of course that's, you know, elevated, you know, three plus stories, um, but still some, some fairly significant win for, for how far away that storm was. Um, golf resort, Liz, you got anything? Um, in regards to the storm, I wanted to thank Aaron specifically for responding so quickly. We did have, um, we did lose an osprey nest during that storm and he very quickly was able to create a temporary platform um, for us to hold, hold the, um, the juvenile. So um, appreciate that, Aaron. That was very quick um, work on your part. Um, other than that, not much going on. We have started construction here at night Heron Park. Um, so you will see fencing up um, in the back of our pavilion area, but the nature center will remain open. So um, operating as normal here in the park, even though there is construction happening. That's all. Thanks, Liz. Um, ARB, no. Conservancy, anything else? Yeah, just a quick update. So, you know, I think we've been working on the Emergency Coastal Resilience Fund. It's the uh, federal grant that we received the, uh, last year. Um, one of the things we're looking into is different types of living shorelines and green infrastructure. And uh, uh, about two weeks ago, we had uh, two people give a webinar on uh, specific types of practices. We had Michael Hodges with uh, uh, SEDNR SCORE program talk about living shorelines. Uh, we also had Kim Morganello talk about rain gardens, um, and it was about an hour long or so for each webinar, uh, and we recorded them. So if anybody's interested on this committee who's uh, you know interested in these types of projects and uh, what we're, we're doing with uh, sort of this information, uh, feel free to reach out and I can give you a link to, to watch the recording. Sounds good. Thanks, Lee. Um, Turtle Patrol, Lynn? 
Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. I lost the video feed a while ago, but didn't want to click on anything because I could hear everything that was going on. Um, we have 281 nests as of now. The nesting season is still underway and we have not had any hatchings or emergences yet. Other islands have our uh, oldest nest is at 65 days today, so it's imminent. It should be happening soon. Thanks, Lynn. All right, I guess we're done. Citizens comments? I don't see any. Committee member comments? All right, I skipped chairman's comments, but I don't have any. So thanks y'all. And um, we'll take a, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, second. Lee, all, right, all in favor?